Puzzles are probably among the most common mechanics that can be found in video games. Even action-heavy games tend to feature puzzles in one form or another. Think of the many hacking or lockpicking minigames you can find across gaming as a whole. Well, these are all puzzles. Most of the puzzles you can find in video games tend to be fairly straightforward. You have a set of initial conditions and you have to find a solution. Typically, there is only one single solution to any given puzzle. And that's fine, I've enjoyed quite a few dedicated puzzle games where there was only one valid solution that I had to figure out. But there's also another kind of puzzle game. One that only gives you a set of tools and a goal. How you reach that goal is up to you. It not only tests your logical deductive abilities, but also your creativity, which I find very rewarding. And there's one company that has excelled at these games for the better part of two decades, and they're called Zaktronics. Their early output was mostly made by the eponymous Zach Barth shortly after he left college. Probably the most notable game he made during that time was Infiniminer. If you have even a passing familiarity with his games, you'll know that this was the inspiration behind what would eventually become Minecraft. Even though, by his own admission, he had quite a different aim with his game than what would eventually become one of the best-selling games of all time. I'm sure he's sick and tired of hearing this disclaimer at this point, so I'll swiftly move on. Outside of that, he also engaged in the creation of puzzle games. Zaktronics have also dabbled in other genres, but for the purposes of this video I will be focusing on their puzzle games, since those are the ones that felt most compelling to me. If you're interested in playing their early games, you're in luck, because you can get them entirely for free. If you head over to Steam, you can look up the game Zack-like. You'll get a couple of things in there. One is an extensive look back at all their games up to Exapunks, where much of the historical information here was derived from. But you also get all the early games and prototypes. If you've played Zaktronics' later output, and compare it to what he made during the early years, you can clearly see the evolution and refinement of the core Zaktronics formula. Obviously, you'll have to expect that these early outputs are much less polished than their commercial releases. Now when I say formula, what I mean by that is that these games share quite a few elements between each other. As mentioned before, they're first and foremost puzzle games, but with the aim of giving you a space to explore the mechanics available to you, so you can come up with your own solutions instead of finding the one dreamt up by the creator of the puzzle. Broadly speaking, Zektronics games usually fall into one of two categories, programming and visual automation. In essence, both types are about programming and automation, but about half of the games embrace the programming aspect more directly, while the other half tries its best to hide that layer away behind some type of abstraction. So let's take a look at the programming games first. Now when I say programming, I mean that in the most literal way imaginable. You write source code that gets executed to solve a problem. The games that go into this direction are TIS-100, Shenzhen.io and Exapunks. These games don't require that you're already familiar with any programming language, since they implement their own custom languages. These languages are very low level, inspired by assembly languages, which are about as low level as you're reasonably ever going to get without coding in literal binary. To learn these languages, the games provide you with little manuals with all the available instructions along with a few short code snippets to help you understand what you're supposed to be doing. What I like most about these manuals is that you can print them out yourself and create a physical instruction manual. The digital age has obviously brought many improvements and made many more games far more accessible to a wider audience. But I personally still fondly think back to physical releases that came in boxes or DVD cases filled with maps and instruction manuals. So getting to print one myself was really cool. Not to mention that having a physical piece of paper in front of me as a reference guide to find information was much less of a hassle than having to alt-tab out of the game to look up the documentation in a PDF file. The downside of games that rely on mostly text input from players is that it doesn't make for visually stimulating content. This is doubly true if you're just an audience on YouTube, with, I assume, no working understanding of the made-up programming language you see in front of you. I personally was never bothered by the fact that I was looking at the same screen for goodness is how long it took me to solve certain puzzles, but I can certainly understand if this makes the games entirely unappealing to some of you. And make no mistake, these games are tightly focused on this one single aspect. If you're picking up a Zaktronics game about coding, you'll be mostly doing exactly that. That doesn't mean that these three games that share this method of automation are exactly identical though. TIS-100 is probably the simplest of the bunch, mostly relying on you passing values along and manipulating them in a way that generates the desired output. On the top left, you're given a short prompt on what you have to do. 
Below that are the inputs your program will have to accept and the corresponding outputs it should deliver. You have to move values between these boxes while manipulating them in some way so that they match the expected output. Simple in this case doesn't mean easy though. The very limited instruction set means you have to get creative when it comes to storing and manipulating data, especially once you're dealing with control flow, meaning if-else statements or loops. And its stark monochrome visuals that evoke the late 80s certainly make it the least visually appealing of the bunch. In retrospect, it does seem like this is very much a jumping off point for later endeavors in the same vein. Shenzhen I.O. by contrast is a much more polished affair. While you're still mostly typing text, your goal here is to program little microcontrollers. You're given quite a variety of tools to solve these problems, so it's not just a screen full of boxes intended to be filled with code. You have a few modules on the right that serve different purposes, and you must read a variety of electrical signals in different ways to generate the appropriate output, as seen at the bottom of the screen. Since you're given quite a few components to work with, which are all manufactured by different in-universe companies, you also get the corresponding datasheets about these components that differ wildly in scope and quality. There's even one written entirely in Chinese. And if you play for long enough, you're clued into the fact that the programming language you've been using has a really useful undocumented command in there. It tries to evoke this feeling of real-world software engineering, where you aren't always given perfect information and often encounter roadblocks that have nothing to do with solving the task at hand. The game also has more of a storyline. You work for a company in Shenzhen, China and have to create electronic products that serve some type of purpose. Between puzzles you get to read email conversations between your co-workers and bosses that add some much desired flavor to proceedings. As I said, it feels much more polished than TIS-100 was and offers much more variety both visually and in terms of problems you get to solve. Exapunks, by contrast, is a bit simpler overall in that you're once again reduced to a single component that you can program, which are the eponymous exas, little programs that are visualized as these robotic-looking creatures. Given that these games are mostly about programming, it was inevitable that one of them would eventually tackle the theme of hacking. That means that your goal in Exapunks is to program these exas to infiltrate networks and retrieve or manipulate data without leaving a trace. You can either use multiple exas from the start with different programming or spawn exas from each other to solve multiple tasks simultaneously and one of the skills you have to develop is efficiently moving around these networks and manipulating files in order to move data between them. There's also a secondary aspect of your body being continuously replaced by machinery thanks to a fictional illness that you have to deal with periodically, but these tasks follow the same basic formula of the other missions. Thanks to the hacker aesthetic, the two included documents aren't just manuals, they're in-universe magazines that outline the workings of the programming language and they even give you hints about how to interact with the various networks you'll be encountering. Overall, I feel that Exapunks is the most polished programming game by Zektronix. It's a little less broad in scope than Shenzhen I.O. was, but that makes it much more accessible. If you want to dabble with one of these games and aren't afraid of learning a very basic programming language, Exapunks is probably the way to go as a gateway drug. If you end up enjoying it, you'll probably also want to check out the previous games, because in truth they're all fun. And hey, who knows, if you weren't into programming before playing these games, maybe you are after. But be warned, these games games can offer quite steep difficulty curves and sometimes contain spikes that seem to come out of nowhere. There's no hand-holding beyond what you're given in the instruction manuals. Figuring out the rest is entirely up to you, so a healthy dose of curiosity is certainly required to get into these games. So now that we've covered the programming games, it's time to move on to the automation games. As I alluded to before, in essence all the Zactronics puzzle games are about programming in some way or another. But I'm inclined to separate the two by how much they abstract away that programming from the player. The three games I've mentioned first are not very abstract. You write code and execute it. It's no different from doing the same with any text editor. The quote-unquote automation games don't directly have you write out programs, but they still work with the same principles, giving you some type of input to manipulate in order to produce an output. Since I went through the programming games chronologically, I'll do the same for these automation games. Space Chem actually came out before TIS-100 and is probably the studio's biggest hit to date. Even though the theme of the game is chemistry, don't fret, you're not required to know anything about chemistry to play the game. It's just that the game represents its inputs and outputs as chemical elements and molecules that you get to manipulate. 
To that end, you have to move them around this grid with these round symbols called Waldos. They can pick up elements, move them, rotate them and bond them together. The trick here is to synchronize the movements of the Waldos to produce the appropriate output while discarding the bits that aren't needed. You're creating these tracks that the Waldos travel along and whenever they pass one of these instructions, they execute them. You should by now be able to tell that this is nothing other than programming, just in a more visual way. In essence, you're still doing the same thing as in the pure programming games, just not by using text input. There's also a secondary layer to the gameplay later on, where you're given a top-down map of your surroundings where you have to link up a variety of buildings, either to get the input materials or to deliver the output materials. This too sometimes requires syncing up deliveries from multiple sources to not cause congestion somewhere in the system once you start producing molecules that serve as the basis for later manipulations further down the road. But beware, just because Space Cam isn't about literal programming, don't expect this game to be any easier. There are still some tough nuts to crack. The game even has boss battles where you have to produce the outputs before the enemy manages to destroy your resource centers. Infinifactory also came out before TIS 100 and to date it's the only of the Sectronix puzzle games that features 3D graphics. The game reuses the blocky world design of Infiniminer but instead uses it to recreate the now familiar puzzle formula. You've got conveyor belts, blocks that push, rotate, weld or destroy other blocks, counters, sensors and conduits to connect these to create custom logic for your assembly line. The 3D perspective is both a blessing and a bit of a curse for this game. On the one hand, it's certainly much more visually stimulating to fly around these levels and place blocks to gather materials from spawners and manipulate them on the way to the output spots. Out of all the games in the Zactronix puzzle catalog, this is the only one that doesn't take place on a largely static 2D background. It really tests your imagination to come up with contraptions that work in 3D space. But that also leads to a lot of complexity that goes into your solutions. Building the mechanisms and repeatedly testing them to see if each step along the way produces the desired outcome is very time consuming. And it's made much more difficult by the fact that you can't observe the state of the entire machine all at once like you could in all the other games. That doesn't make Infinifactory a bad game, not at all, I'm really fond of it and I enjoyed the added wrinkle of having to deal with a 3D perspective to build these assembly lines. It's a skill that none of the other games tackles, but it sacrifices some of the ease and accessibility of the purely two-dimensional games in the process. Opus Magnum once again picks up the chemistry theme, but this time in a bit of a different fashion since it's all about alchemy. The principle remains the same though, you have a set of raw ingredients, in this case the four classical elements, salt and some metals, and you have to use them to produce the desired results. The principal way of moving around these ingredients is through rotating arms. The game is set on a hexagonal grid where you get to place these arms to grab, move, rotate, combine or split these various raw materials to produce the correct output. To do that you have a timeline at the bottom of the screen upon which you can place the symbols that represent the actions you want the corresponding arms to execute. So once again a degree of synchronization is necessary. But the simplicity of programming with this timeline along with the speed of iteration it allows makes it much less less challenging and tedious than Infinifactory was. Opus Magnum is the game that's probably the most directly inspired by one of the early Zactronics games since it's clearly based on the concepts of the Codex of Alchemical Engineering. But while the central concept is derived from that early game, Opus Magnum is a much more polished game overall. In fact, like Exapunks, Opus Magnum is probably the game I'd recommend most to people unfamiliar with the typical Zactronics formula but who aren't into literal programming. It's very well tutorialized and the progression through the levels in Opus Magnum is much more structured than in previous games, so you're not bound to get lost in some of the complexity that can crop up in earlier games, especially during the later levels. The last game in this category, Molex Synthes, combines elements from quite a few previous games. Once again, the game is about chemistry, like Space Chem. It features the same hexagonal grid layout seen in Opus Magnum, but this time limits your interactivity to manipulators on the borders around the grid. And the sparse monochromatic visuals obviously harken back to TIS 100's aesthetic. Now it's easy to assume that this is just a rehash of Opus Magnum with its timeline and hexagonal layout. But there is enough of a twist to the formula that I'd call Molex Synth as an entirely different beast nonetheless. For one, you're strictly limited to the grid you can see, while Opus Magnum's grid, outside of the challenge levels, was functionally limitless. 
This spatial constraint forces you to build compact solutions. The same thing applies to the timeline. You have a fixed number of steps you can program to produce the correct output, so there's a ceiling of how long your program can ever be. The input is also limited to a fixed number of molecules that serve as the basis for every output, while Opus Magnum gave you custom inputs for every single puzzle. Producing results in Molex Synthes requires you to be more analytical, both in terms of what source molecules to choose and how to manipulate them thanks to the limitations regarding space and number of actions. So while on the surface Molex Synthes might look like a lesser offshoot of Opus Magnum, it's anything but. It still offers a hefty challenge and unique puzzles that aren't merely copy-paste of what came before. Now I've given you a small overview of what these games offer, but I've left out one crucial detail that all of them share, and that's how the game rates the success of your solutions. Obviously finding a solution is perfectly valid for any given puzzle, and you can leave it at that if you want. But what really elevates the experience of Zaktronics games is seeing the little histograms at the end once you've successfully solved the puzzle. While there aren't any global leaderboards, the games do still collect data on how well you're doing and compares you that way. This happens anonymously except when one of your Steam friends also owns the game and has provided a solution, then you also get to see their scores and vice versa. I really like these metrics, because you're never only solving the problem just once. The games run through a gauntlet of test data and your solutions have to spit out the correct values every time. You can't cheat your way through and just hope that whatever you've hard-coded into your solution gets a pass. Just like in real programming, the functions you create have to be ignorant of what happens outside of them, they have to work with arbitrary input that you have to account for. Once you've proven that your solution works for all the problems, you get ranked. Every game rates you a little differently though. While all of them have cycles as a measure of how long the program took to run, some count the lines of code or number of symbols aka instructions it took, some look at the size of the mechanism you've built or the cost of the solution. And here's where more of the fun lies. Either seeing that your solution beats a majority of other players or, at least in my case, noticing that your solution is woefully inefficient. You can always go back to any challenge, open up a new solution while keeping the previous ones and start over. You can also copy existing solutions if you want to tinker with one of them to see if you can squeeze out more performance. And as an added twist, there's no single solution that will net you a top ranking in all three metrics, especially for the later levels. So if you're the type of person who likes optimization, you will absolutely fall in love with these metrics. Trying to find out how you can solve a problem the fastest or with the fewest lines of code adds a whole other challenge on top of the already existing one. Obviously, this can also lead to the problem of demotivation, like if your solution takes up twice as long as everybody else's. But honestly, as someone who regularly overshoots the average, since I'm really not that good of a programmer, I personally didn't mind. The challenges are tough enough already on their own, so anyone who even manages to solve them is pretty darn good at these games in my book. How do I figure that? Well, take a look at the achievements for these games. At the time of editing this video, here's the percentage of people who have beaten these games. Even I, as someone telling you that you should go and play these games, can't rightfully claim to have beaten all of them. As of right now, I've only gotten through Opus Magnum and Molex Sintas all the way through. But even though I didn't beat all the games, I still had a ton of fun with them. Since these games don't really have narratives that are that deep or important to the game, there's no shame in stopping when you feel like you've had enough. There's a talk Zach Barth gave at Google where he mentions that he feels it's better for a game to still have content for you to chew through than just end while leaving you thirsty for more. And I like that philosophy, especially for games where narrative isn't the main focal point. Who knows, maybe I'll jump back into one of these unfinished games and complete them later. I already have the urge to go back to Space Chem and play the whole game all over again to see if what I've learned about programming in the intervening years means I'll produce better solutions. At this point, if you're familiar with the Zaktronics games, you might be wondering why I haven't mentioned their final game, Last Call BBS, until now. Well, honestly, I don't want to talk at great length about it, because I feel like this should be one of those bonus experiences you get once you've played through all their other games. I'll give you a brief overview of what to expect from Last Call BBS, but I don't want to delve too deeply into it. In essence, Last Call BBS is a collection of eight games built on the basis of a fictional 90s computer system that harkens back to the days of the IBM PC and the Commodore Amiga. When you boot up the game, you're greeted with an old-school desktop layout. By default, you're only given a solitaire game. Which reminds me, pretty much all of the previously discussed games had some sort of solitaire variant as an optional minigame in there, 
so this is pretty much par for the course for Zektronix games, but I digress. You can also find a browser on that computer and through that connect to a bulletin board system or BBS for short. These were very common in the 80s and 90s, you could connect to these and use them for reading news, chat with other people and crucially download software. These were early ways of online software piracy and the way you acquire the 8 games is through this BBS. Some of them are even quote unquote cracked versions that feature the famous intro messages by the people responsible for bypassing the copy protection. And the attention to detail doesn't just stop there, it goes so far that you actually have to wait a couple of minutes to quote unquote download each game and after each transfer you have to wait some time to initiate another download once your quota resets. Luckily your computer can multitask and you can just start playing the first game you've downloaded or pass the time with the built-in solitaire version. Some of the games are rather simple in nature, like the second variant of Solitaire. One of the downloads is arguably not even a game, it's more a pleasant way to kill some time, building these pretend models and painting them. There's no real point to these, you're not graded or anything, it's just a neat little program to spend some time with. Dungeons and Diagrams is probably the most straightforward puzzle game Zactronics have ever made. You're tasked with building dungeons around these creatures and treasures according to a few rules. As far as I can tell, there's only one solution and no histograms or anything. You either solve the puzzle or you don't. Last Call BBS is also full of references to the previous Zactronics games, both in terms of quote unquote lore you can find, but it also takes mechanics and concepts from previous games and incorporates them here. Hackmatch is directly lifted from Exapunks, but with an added single player campaign. Chip Wizard is very reminiscent of quite a few previous games like Silicon Foundry, Constructor and Shenzhen IO, where you have to build circuits with some very primitive methods. But if you're a Zactronics veteran, the two games you absolutely have to check out are 20th Century Food Court and, however you're supposed to pronounce that, colon The Forbidden Path. 20th Century Food Court has you build conveyor belt systems to produce various meals. It harkens back to one version of Manufactoid, a very early game Barth made in college. It has all the elements of a classic Zactronics game, a simple to understand problem and a large possibility space of how you want to tackle it. What I really enjoyed about this game was the means of programming these machines. You link them up by using patch cables. It reminded me a lot of Working With Reason, a digital audio workstation that uses a skeuomorphic approach to its user interface, where you load in modules not as mere abstract entities, but as quote unquote physical rack units that you can connect by virtually wiring them up with each other, as you would if you had a real synth rack in front of you to work with. In the same vein, you hook up machines, sensors and counters in this rack view and connect them so they work together to produce the desired result. This is probably a game that could have easily been sold as a standalone title in its own right. It's not a mere minigame to pass the time. It has all the mechanics you'd want out of a Zactronics game and quite a few puzzles to solve that aren't mere cakewalks. The last game, I'm just gonna call it The Forbidden Path, is probably my favorite of the bunch though. For one, just look at it. I love the Giger-esque visuals of the game. The UI is so deliciously macabre and the little cutscenes and excellent music give the game a haunting and otherworldly atmosphere. But beware though, the game has literally no instructions on how to play it. It's very cryptic, by design, and you will have to intuit what you can do here. I don't want to spoil the experience here because it's best if you go into it like I did, without a single clue as to what's going on, but I'll say that it definitely evokes a bygone era when game design wasn't as formalized as it is today and when weird concepts or wacky ways of interacting with a game were much more common. And that's unfortunately it. Zactronics have announced that Last Call BBS would be their final game, which prompted me to finally make this overview of their catalogue. I've been planning to make this video for quite a while, since I was enamored with their games ever since I first started playing them, but it took me a lot longer than expected. For one, I underestimated how long it would actually take to play through all of these games. They might look simple on the surface, but again, there are puzzles in there that can take literal hours of brainstorming and tinkering to get right, especially if you get caught up in the maelstrom of optimization. If you're a better programmer than me, which isn't a high bar I admit, you'll probably have an easier time than me, but as a layperson I'd say these games aren't something you can beat in a weekend. The second reason it took so long was because honestly, after I was done with one of the games, I didn't want to immediately start with the next one. This isn't to diminish any of these games, but they don't lend themselves to being binged through. Sometimes you just want to kick back and relax and solving programming challenges isn't something I personally do to relax. 
Sometimes you're just not in the mood to solve problems after having done so during your day job already. So I had to pad out my playthroughs with other games in between. Still, I didn't regret playing any of the Zaktronics games and I hope that if you've never heard of any of them, you at least give one of them a shot at convincing you that they're worth playing. Because they absolutely are.